The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. We focus on the third and fourth case study. These case studies, which will conclude on Thursday with Chicago, are all examples of what 19th century urbanism or pre-modern urbanism contended with. They all contended more or less with similar circumstances. The rise of industrial poverty, the weakening of the aristocracy and the royal presence, in some cases the existence of walls for fortification which had been redundant, becoming, becoming redundant. Chicago is very different. Chicago has no royalty no aristocracy, no walls. So Thursday we will look at Chicago comparatively. Today I want to look at two case studies. One of Vienna, which has a great deal to do with walls. And the second is Barcelona, which we're going to focus on the, the most common emancipation in the 19th century from some of these problems. That is to leave the center of city alone and build on new land outside. Sardar's plan for Barcelona is the largest housing project, planned housing project in the world. Certainly the largest housing project in Europe. Let's start with Vienna. Vienna was the major bastion. Well, let me uh, try to explain what I gave you. The first diagram is the replacement of the walls and the various sectors of the continuous road, two and a half mile road, which, rep uh, which became the urban symbol of the post a post-feudal city. The second is an elevation of Karl Markshof, which is this, an element in the third stage of the city, from the feudal city to the liberal city to the socialist city for a relatively short time, from 1919 onwards. The next page is the ensemble of that part of Barcelona, which is, which is based on the 1859 plan of Ildefonso Cerda. It's called the ensemble. You can see the extens, extended pattern of the similar block. The next page of the two competitors winning two finalists in the competition, Sardar's plan on the north, the print is a little obscured, and the, uh, the alternative plan, Antonio Rivas y Trio's plan. We'll discuss this in some detail. The next page is the, uh, an element of Sardar's plan. The, the same square block, 113 meters by 113 meters, with options for development to create a flexible environment in which only a portion of the block is built. And lastly is a town in Puglia in southern Italy, southern Italy showing our 
the conventional plan which exists in smaller towns, maintaining the central area, developing a grid system outside the central area, connected to the central area by the gates of the walls. Okay. Vienna. Who threatened Vienna from the 16th century to the 18th to the 17th century? Yeah. Islam focused its threat on the West. I'm forgetting about Islam in North Africa and Spain, but in Central Europe, from Islam made two major attacks on Vienna. 1529, they were repelled, causing the building of walls, the enormous wall system, 20 years later in Vienna. A wall system which had 11 bastions, a moat, and an area called the Glacis, G-L-A-C-I-S. It refers to the open space around the walls for to create an, uh, an arena for military firepower, gun firepower. Do you understand the concept? So you have not only the walls, but you have a span of free space, like a green belt around the walls, which enables improved fortification. These walls were subjected to another major, larger attack by Islam in 1683, in which case, for two months, Vienna was on its last legs. They managed to subvert the, by tunneling under the walls, uh, breaking through from the south, um, and uh, Vienna was within a morning of collapsing when uh, all of the forces galvanized by the Pope in Rome to the, uh, to the extent that he still had support uh, couldn't uh, deflect the energy of the Islam attack. An extraordinary event in history, the king of the Polish Catholic king of Poland, Jan Sobieski, had refused to take part in the defense of Vienna for reasons I don't know. The last morning, Vienna had already been penetrated. The old city had been virtually either people, all the people had been killed or left. Sobieski decided to send his cavalry south to Vienna. They arrived on the Islam had concentrated his attack on the south of the city. It didn't expect any uh, attack from the north, so it was completely vulnerable on the north. So Bieski saved Vienna in one morning. There's a wonderful book on the story of this whole ep ep episode. If you're interested in the book, tell me and I'll give you the title. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, idea of the scale of an Islamic attack, the organization in Istanbul of the army and all the food and all of the uh, prostitutes that accompanied the army as they moved through Hungary to Vienna. That is one of the signal events in the history, urban history of Europe. Had Islam succeeded, there, were, there might have been no, I don't know, certainly probably no Freud, no, perhaps no Beethoven, Mozart, and Haydn, um, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how to 
claim Islam's contribution had it captured Vienna. I don't know what would have, what would have happened to Europe. But Vienna was the fourth largest city in Europe, behind London, Paris, Berlin. Uh, and uh, in many respects, certainly in its last, the last years of the 19th century, uh, one of the major artistic centers of European culture. What year do you think Brahms died? Take a guess. Brahms was born in about 1830. He died in 1897, as late as that. He was the tutor of the philosopher Wittgenstein's sister, taught him the piano. Gustav Mahler played music in the Wittgenstein's houses. The Wittgenstein family owned 12 houses in Vienna itself. Wittgenstein, do you know anything about the history of modern philosophy? Wittgenstein is one of the, Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher, called him the greatest philosophical genius who ever lived. He's part of, he was interested in architecture and he had his, oh, forget about that, it's off on a tangent. But Ludwig Wittgenstein is an art product of the culture of Vienna. So we have a setting in which Vienna survives in 1683 the royal presence maintains itself until about 1860, in which the liberals win in the government, take over the government, and uh, start a process of modernizing the city. Uh, what I didn't mention in the case of Haussmann in Paris was the number of things that Haussmann did in the provision of parks, open space, unifying the bus system, improving the infrastructure of the city as a whole, other than the building of these roads. He's known only for the avenues that he built and the housing that he built on either side of the avenues and for the major monuments. Uh, but at the same time, he built a repertoire of inter infrastructure improvements. The same year, the Danube constantly flooded the city. The city's always been on the southern part of the Danube. The walls were on the, as you can see. Today, the Danube is, uh, fringes the, north the northern boundary of the of the southern city by a canal. The water flooding problem was bypassed and uh, in the same sense, at the same time it was, you know, there were improvements in the health system, the first public hospitals and a whole set of improvements. But Nothing as major as the decision to isolate the center of the city and to build a new environment. Instead of the new environment being similar to the plan of Sardas for Barcelona, it took the extraordinary opportunity for using the glacis and the walls the remnants of the walls, to build a single con container around the outskirts of the old city. This was a container which, in which almost all the sectors of a new middle-class economy could be satisfied. 
number one on your diagram. Textile warehouses and offices on the Danube Canal. Number two, financial center around the stock exchange. Number three, the university. Number four, the famous connection of the parliament, the town hall, the president's palace. Number five, museums. Number six, music. Number seven, private apartments. Now we're in the, the connected structure of urbanism. Has there ever been an attempt to build one continuous movement system accompanied by surroundings as diverse as making up virtually the components of a whole city? It's a dramatic idea, an incredible idea. It had many of its manifestations. First of all, the buildings are not oriented to each other, but oriented to the street. The street is everything that animates the performance of the buildings on its sides. Secondly, Instead of, as in England, the, every effort was made to connect the space beyond the old city with its center city. In this case, the old city was where workers lived. And sorry, not the old city. This is the old city where people were poor, where there were factories, where the hygiene was unclean and untaken care of. Um, this is a zone from year to year is equivalent in size to the whole city, to the old city. Sorry, I'm talking badly this morning. To the old city. So you've constructed a new city along one line, two and a half miles long. It should come, therefore, as no surprise that in 1919, when socialists won, took over the city, that they would concentrate their efforts in the area beyond the Ringstrasse. Karl Marx Hof, which we will look at in little detail, exists outside of the Ring. The Ring didn't contain the elements of the feudal city. Since Stephen's church was not replaced in the ring, the vote of church in the ring is simply a thanksgiving for Vienna's victories. Uh, the Royal Palace Ensemble, which is a large part of the old city, attempted to penetrate onto the ring. Gottfried Semper did a plan for the extension of the Royal Palace pro site to the ring, which has sort of softly connected, but not. The presence on the ring is everything to do with the middle class economy. It's the classic example of a road space dominating everything that surrounds it. We 
You know, in a few minutes' time, when towards the end of our story, when I will concentrate on the difference between proponents of archaism like Camilla Sit, Camilla Sitte, and Otto Wagner, the great modernist. Um, it's interesting, though. Wagner, the modernist, believed he was fascinated by the possibility that one could move along a street, and the street could be there primarily because it supports the significant phenomenon of movement. The buildings on the side of the street had no unifying architecture. In the complex, I'll quote you from somebody who liked the complex, which is the City Hall, the Theatre, the University, and Parliament. I quote, I ran from one object of, inf of interest to another. For hours I would gaze at the Parliament. The whole thing the whole Ring Boulevard seemed to me like an enchantment from the Thousand and One Nights. Who was this? He became a significant figure in history. Even you might know who he is. Adolf Hitler, who wanted to study architecture in Vienna and they wouldn't let him. Pity. <laughs> There was something about the, this complex which exemplifies the interest in, not the interest in, but the fact that there was no consuming architectural style which could unify a street. For instance, in this complex, expression is used, the town hall, is compared to a free medieval com commune and is built in Gothic style. The theater is, exemplifies the aesthetic enthusiasm and is therefore given a Baroque style. The university is the symbol of enlightened culture, is given the Renaissance style. Parliament is a democracy, is given a Greek style. We did a some work in Bratislava, in Slovakia. Bratislava and, Slov and Vienna are the two closest capitals in the world of neighboring countries. We tried to, uh, we had meetings with the deputy mayor of Vienna, who was the chief of Vienna's planning. Who they, to find his office in this Gothic construction, this large Gothic construction, takes uh, almost a, a, a supporting dog. It is still uh, an amazing construction. Um, Camille Cite archaism was to counter the flow of continuous movement in cities. For him, he would break up the continuity by creating plazas at significant intervals along the street. You will, I'll show you a slide of his proposal for one of the plazas. There was no such enthusiasm for curtailing the emphasis of this middle class continuity. I'll just imagine choosing to build buildings according to an image of the essential performance and therefore to choose a historical style which uh, supports that. 
I can't think of it being done anywhere else. By concentrating on the power of a street, perhaps it frees you from any, it allows you to accept any device to create the architecture along it. There's something about a system of streets, a simple system of public ways, which may enable the environment or which supports it to be freer of having to perform those functions, the continuous facade functions. It's an, it's an exa it's a thought which just strikes me from Vienna. If you allowed Zaha Hadid to build in Vienna, in the old city of Vienna, at least you'd have the Ringstrasse to hold you into some public format. The trouble with the new Vienna on the north side of the river is that it has no armature either of the old city or of the Ringstrasse to hold it together. You have buildings which are un, which the entrances to the buildings are unidentifiable. It is the biggest lot of garbage I've ever seen, done by some of Europe's great architects. Uh, there's organization in the ring structure of buildings knowing and showing where you enter them. This is true of all of the buildings of the old city. There's a logic to where the street is, that the street is public, that once you leave the street you are directed by a building as to its performance. Um, it's a powerful con uh, conjunction. The ring stress is about 200 feet wide, which is about the width of Com North Avenue, if I remember. The housing on built on the Ringstrasse was private housing. Again, the tradition of the middle class emulating formally the idea, facade idea of the royalty occurs. I will show you slides of the facades of uh, something called a Gruppensen's house. This is a condominium building. The lots were large and the accumulated building of a, a kind which we now accept as common was, uh, was accepted as the mode. Uh, the financing of the uh, Ringstrasse and was largely state, but also the land was free. So when it, because of the glacis and the walls, belonged to nobody but the state. So the money made in privatizing the parts of the Ringstrasse for housing or offices <coughs> meant a return of income to the city which they could use for parks and other public facilities. Um, it's interesting that throughout the formal agenda of buildings in the various cities, from the feudal city to the Ringstrasse city to the socialist city, certain archetypal ideas. For instance, Karl Marxhoff has sculpture on the facade. It has flags on the facade. This is a Marxist socialist environment uh, which still pays tribute to the royal appurtenances. There's a strong sense of the need to maintain continuity throughout the history of this modern city, or certainly from its 1860 onwards. 
few words about archaism versus modernism. Camilo Cite was an architect and a critic who wrote a book which had a lot of influence. He was against the evident preoccupation of modernism with economic progress, with speed, with fluid, fluidity, with movement, against the rationalization of traffic and hygiene and the technology which is appropriate for that kind of performance. He was much more interested in the world of the artisan, the world of the guild, much like Ruskin perhaps in London. He was attracted by the labor quality of the guild, the disappearance of the guild and the artisan. He was a great admirer of Richard Wagner. He was fascinated by Gesamtkunstwerk, the idea of bringing a genuine folk art to Gibert on the city. Um, so, for him, the Ringstrasse, which was a continuous open space, was uh, uh, a form of enclosure which was antithetical to his view of, uh, of what a city needed. A city needed places, public enclosure, continuity, understanding a kind of psychometric condition in which everything which was close to you would fit your emotional setting. So that if you saw a big building, you would appreciate its bigness because it had a purpose. And you had a continuous space, a public space, from which you could appreciate its emotional circumstance rather than being disrupted by the continuous flow of an open-ended system. Richard Otto Wagner, on the other hand, um, I might point out that um, Camille Cite was not the only person. He was an advocate of the picturesque, of the effective, of the emotional, but he was one of the people who started worrying about the fact that city planning in Europe was Wissenschaft, was moving in, the represent, in, the, in, in, in its representation only of the two-dimensional surface of the city. For Cité, the third dimension was being excluded. Referring to Baumeister, the German books on traffic engineering, Baumeister's book of 1876 and Heinrich Stuben's book of 1907, quote, the traffic systems and direction of their flow form the basis of the plan, plan of construction of cities. So city growth, city enlargement, city planning was seen as a two-dimensional exercise of the organization of movement. Wagner was too sensitive an architect. In fact, he was a kind of hybrid personality. The demands of efficiency, economy, and physics were attractive to him. He was a modern man. He believed the city could expand in, in his projects for the expansion of Vienna or reproductions of the old city of Vienna, about 100,000 to 150,000 units, all linked by movement systems. He spent his time building buildings for the new Danube Canal, sluice gates. He did the wonderful uh, subway stop, the Karlplatz, the number of the subway stops in the new Vienna subway system. At the same time, he was. If he designed neoclassical monuments. Uh, he 
it's great. Those of you in Vienna should go to the to see his small church in the uh, medical facility, housing facility uh, in the city. Uh, it's been restored with a golden dome and doesn't look like anything that a modernist would have anything to do with. Perhaps his most significant building is the Postal Savings Bank on the Ringstrasse, the only building that he built on the Ringstrasse, which has a rectangular grid set of windows, but between the grid set of windows there are phone tiles decorated with floral decorations, sinuous floral decorations. Yeah, I've said most of the things that I want to say. There's a... Amongst Otto's, Wagner's fascination was what he called the painless uncertainty of modernism, which is an extraordinary kind of comment, that if you pay Wagner, in my mind, was a brilliantly confused man at a time of the intersection of traditionalism with modernism. His architecture, if those of you who want to study his architecture, look at the work of a great architect. Uh, he had an enormous influence where a number of his students were involved in the building of the Hofs. Uh, after 1919. But the idea of painless uncertainty, that one is not going to be sure about what is going to happen over time. In fact, it is impossible to know what's going to happen over time. And therefore, you have to try to understand how to deal with uncertainty. This is the first time that I think a 19th century architect or city person makes an important statement <coughs> about what preoccupies a lot of the thinking in the 20th century and still does today. That is open-endedness, diversity, change, and a number of the associated phenomena. We will see in Sardar's plan for Barcelona an attempt to allow for that to take place. But just two other stories. The post-1919 story. The real estate speculation uh, after the rebuilding of the ring stars that had resulted in enormous increases in rent Appalling housing conditions for working class. In the 1917 census showed that 73% of Vienna housing was, quote, in the unspeakable conditions of overcrowding and IG. Workers were paying 25% of their income to housing. In 1919, the Vienna became Red Vienna with a socialist majority. And Red Vienna has remained, there's a book by Yves Blau at Harvard on Red Vienna, which is worth looking at. But there was a, this was a time when the London County Council in London was established, a similar uh, planning operation in Berlin. From 1919 to 1925, they invested in a radical policy of land acquisition, uh, 
law controlling rent and the building of, of new apartments. By 1934, they had built 63,700 dwellings, equivalent to 70% of the entire production between the wars, housing something like a tenth of the city's population. There was a controversy about what form these new socialist housing should take place. Out of Lewis the, and the, a number of other architects proposed following the German example of the Siedlungen. Siedlungen, the famous Siedlungen in Stuttgart and so on, uh, were examples of housing the poor in green circumstances with, sing, with houses which were single family with gardens and self-sufficiency but deprived from the center of the city. Leopold, uh, no. Another group of people felt that it was about time that the workers made their presence felt. And the way to they could make this, their presence felt, was to develop pug pugnacious housing response to the market housing. This took the form of the Hof, H-O-F. Hof is the same word in Dutch, in German, as court. So in the, by calling their housing a court, they have another reflection back to the feudal city. It seems to me that revolutionists never abandon everything. They abandon the key variable, or they destroy the key variable, the market, and maintain everything else of a secondary order. We look at this in the, when we discuss the post-revolutionary work in Russia from 1917, particularly to 1932, in the work of the disurbanists and urbanists and others. Karl Marxhoff is the largest of the uh, enterprises. There were a number of them. Narski Hof, Reismann Hof, Rabenhof, Matteotti Hof, Samoji Hof, built between 1924 and 1927. Karl N., the architect for Karl Marx office, a rather undistinguished figure. He worked in the city government. Uh, he had done some housing. Um, uh, unfortunately, he stayed on and worked for the Nazis uh, as well. So. Maybe his vocabulary was very widespread. Uh, Karl Marxhoff was a pugnacious island which built apartments, 1,380 apartments, plus a large interior space containing nurseries, collective laundries, library, offices, shops, clinic, and so on. This period didn't last very long, and uh, Karl Marxhoff and Red Vienna remained as a kind of intellectual fascination for our urbanists afterwards. Uh, Karl Marxhoff is still worth visiting today. It's located, connected to the center of the city by light rail, by heavy rail, by bus. Uh, it's easy to get to. It's extraordinarily large. Uh, has anybody been to Vienna? What did you see in Vienna? Museum <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. It's a wonderful <laughs> museum. You couldn't go to a concert, I suppose. There's no democracy of tickets in Vienna. Vienna, 
I had to listen to the Vienna Philharmonic play in Cleveland because <laughs> I've always wanted to hear the Vienna Philharmonic play. Uh, Vienna Philharmonic didn't include women in August until relatively recently. So there are a lot of throwbacks. The attitude towards Jews is signally despicable. Gustav Mahler, who was born a Jew and a Bohemian, in order to become the conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic, he had to become Catholic temporarily so that he could play music. Extraordinary stories. You should go to the Judenplatz in, in, in the old city where the Jews were massacred. There's a wonderful sculpture by a British sculptor, woman, I forget her name, who's built a concrete sculpture made of books um, as a remnant. One last thing about Vienna. Uh, the last 10, 10, 20 years of the end of that century, Vienna underwent one of the great cultural performance spans, which we associate with great cities. We associated with for. 15th century Florence, the great painters, the great sculptors, the Medici family. Um, this is a similar period in the West. In the West, uh, We have the transference from 19th century romantic music to modern music. Uh, Brahms died in 1897, Schoenberg lived from 1874 to 1951, Alban Berg from 1885 to 1935, Anton Webern 1882 to 1945, Gustav Mahler from 1860 to 1911. These were the people who invented the post-romantic music of, for us. You may not like the music. Amongst them, only Schoen Mahler's in our convention he played by the Boston Phil and August. Nobody, very few people play Schoenberg except in their living rooms. Uh, uh, Watzek, the opera is performed now and then. Uh, Alban Berg's music. But this is the significance of a city, that it can transform culture in significant ways. Why it happens in cities? Austria, Vienna was not its economic, after the separation of the, no, that took place, it was later. There are a number of theories as to why this happens. Peter Hall, the British urbanist, has written about this in one of his books. Um, there's a sort of culmination or the coming together of all of the elements of good culture in a place. This despite anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism, which was taken over by the Nazis when they took over Austria. Um, it happened in New York with the from 1940 to 19, well, 1945 to 1970, with the invention of a number of new forms of modern art, the great painters Jackson Pollock uh, and others. I just mention it because it's something that is not indulged in. Not many cities in the world grab the world it's no, and it's very difficult to explain the, what in the history of Vienna predicted this. It's certainly true that the great romantic composers, Mozart, Haydn, and 
Beethoven spent time in Vienna. The music was constantly performed. People learned to play the music. Wittgenstein's sister, for as an example, uh, there were small groups of philosophy. The Vienna Circle of Philosophers in the 1920s were significant. There was music played in houses. Uh, people were familiar. This Wittgenstein had a large, Wittgenstein's father had a large set of children. Three of them committed suicide. Uh, one of them, they were all musically attuned. One of them, as a child, could apparently, according to a biography, distinguish between a, when a band played outside their house, he could tell what was wrong with the band's playing, he could tell which instruments were playing the wrong music. Um, so there was a culture of music built into the society. I don't know if Freud had anything to do with music. He probably was too busy uh, with his trying to understand the psychic mind. So the Vienna story is an art story of a number of things. The move from a feudal to a liberal to a social city and then back, <coughs> back to a modern city. A number of things that I've touched on. It's one of the great cities uh, in history. Uh, it's the only city which built a single road to him dedicate itself to a new environment, economically and socially. And what else can one say about Vienna? It's still a city which is remarkably well cared for planning-wise. The deputy mayor had a staff of something like 1,500 people in his planning transportation section. It has uh, a journey to work, which is 60%, I think, in public transportation, 40% in private transportation. It's, it's done very well. Barcelona is a smaller city out on the fringes. All of these cities, of course, were Roman cities. London, Paris, Vienna, and Barcelona. The story of Barcelona and Cerda uh, Assange is a complicated story and requires a lot of time, so I'll jump very quickly. The old city of <coughs> Barcelona, with its Roman walls and then its enlarged walls, was the densest in Europe in 1830. It had 300 inhabitants per hectare, which was twice the density of the very dense Paris. It suffered from epidemics in 1834, 1854, 1864, and 1870. The, between 1837 and 1847, average life expectancy amongst men was 38.9 for the rich and 19.7 for the poor. It's difficult to believe that the average life expectancy could be under 20 years of age. But if you include infant mortality in that, infant mortality takes a large number of deaths. And uh, so we have a condition of an old city. Uh, no apparent market for uh, it's for 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 the wealthy occupying the old city. No program is in Paris or London for the transformation of the uh, old city. There was no royalty in Barcelona. Royalty was in Madrid. There was a constant tension between 
Barcelona and Madrid. In fact, Barcelona claimed a certain independence for Catalonia, and Catalonia has always been stuck between Spain and France. Perhaps well, that's why Picasso comes from Catalonia. Um, I want to jump into the story of the extension. The extension is the mark of one man's thinking. It was a man who was Irifonse Serda, born in 1845, uh, sorry, 1815, decided to study engineering in, at the age of 19, went to Madrid to, he comes from Barcelona, went to Madrid to study, graduated in 1847, enlisted in the National Militia from 1841 to 1848, did projects in cities in Spain, highways, infrastructure for the Ministry of Engineering. He developed a powerful political base in Madrid. He returned to Barcelona in 1849. In 1854, the walls began to be taken down. Serra did something extraordinary. He first of all decided to do research in the old city. Volumes in volume three of his book, General Themes of Urbanization, written in 1858, he details patterns of food consumption, compares the old city with other cities, detailed maps, mortality rates. He found that the bourgeois had an average of 3.6 cubic meters of space whereas the working class had he only, only had 0 0.9. That's four times less. Imagine this man going into the old city and doing all of this work. I don't know what his ambitions were, but this example of research before plan stands as the first time somebody has taken the obligation to study existing facts, especially about poverty. Remember that Booth's map in London was 1789, and now 1879. Uh, this was before Booth's map of London. Uh, This is not Engels studying Manchester. Engels studied Manchester, partly to gather the facts on which to base a large universal theory of society. It's unclear what Serda was doing. He just wanted to know facts. He wanted to know reality. He had no large theory, apparently he didn't have. In 1859, there was a competition for building of a plan, for designing a plan outside the old city. Serda and a man called Trias, Rovira y Trias, competed for the final. The architects in general and the, most of the people of Barcelona preferred Rovira y Trias's plan. Rovira y Trias took the old city as the center, created the Piazza de la Repubblica north of it, and from that point radiated out five avenues out to the perimeter. Uh, this is a neoclassical plan which uh, was relatively common in city expansion. 
Sherdar's plan was a series of 113 meters by 113 meters blocks, all identical except for the disposition of the buildings on them. So there was a grid system laid out over an extensive area. It could continue without disruption. The roads were 20 meters, 35 meters or 50 meters wide. It was six cubic meters of space per person. It was double the middle income level at the time. It was part of Sardar that was extremely rational. That formula on the, that is on the left is his formula for the width of the road, uh, uh, x being the side of the block, 2b being with the width of the street, F being the depth of the building site, V being the number of inhabitants per house, P equals the, meter, the square meters size per person, D equals the height of the facade, all rationally calculated in, in to produce a, a formula, the detail of the formula is not important, it's nonsense. But it shows something about the mind of a person who What's going on in his mind? He's trained as an engineer. He's worked in cities all over Spain. He returns to Barcelona, spends his efforts documenting poverty, then emerges with a plan. There's an interesting side story to this. The critics and writers about the Ensemble in Barcelona are extraordinarily loyal to the Barcelona and to Ildefonso Cerda, who is considered a national hero. By the way, the reason the city chose Cerda's plan over Trias's plan was because of pressure from Madrid. Serda in his years in Madrid working for the National Militia had made friends and uh, this radical plan was forced on Barcelona. Now Barcelona cannot be happier about the plan. Serda is a great hero. There's an aspect of Serda which comes through not from Barcelonans, I don't know the Barcelona literature extensively, but a man has recently written a book pointing out that Serda belonged to a small group of people in intellectuals in uh, Barcelona who were attracted to socialism. Uh, amongst the members was a man called Monturiol was one of the designers of the modern submarine. Strange people, poets. Apparently they were very influenced by a French intellectual utopianist called Etienne Cabet, C-A-B-E-T, who wrote a book called A Voyage to Ecreria. Cabet proposed in his ideal city a center with a capital and then an equal distribution of space every 360 degrees around the center. Cabet worked in the British Museum reading room just like Marx did. I don't think they knew each other, they were years apart. Cabet <coughs> insisted that the United States was the place to build his utopia, as many Europeans did. Uh, Fourier, for instance. Uh, there's a paradox about Fourier and the Fourierist community in the United States, but 
That's for another class when we talk about utopianism next week. Cabay bought land in New Orleans and took 79 Cabetians with him to New Orleans. They hated New Orleans. The climate was awful. They didn't know anything about the land they bought. They were sold a piece of land which was very bad. They moved north to Novu, N-A-U-V-O-O, Illinois, which was one of the sequence of places that the Mormons s capitalized on on the trek from the East Coast to Salt Lake City. They took over Novo, Illinois, which didn't succeed. Monturiol, for instance, wanted to join them. He wrote to Kitty and Cabay, but Cabay had died in the meantime, and the whole enterprise suffered terribly. How much of this Serda knew, or how much of this Serda was interested in, is difficult to know. He remains an enigmatic figure, but a man who achieved enormous amounts. His plan was built, built to a certain degree. <coughs> the grid system was maintained, but uh, the amount and disposition of the site was changed. In, s in the diagram on one of the pages I gave you, we'll see Serdar's wish to have a fluctuating system where the site was either occupied by two buildings, three buildings, or four, completely enclosed by four buildings. For Serdar, the height of the facade was to be limited to three floors. There were no elevators in existence yet, anyway. The height of the blocks was 16 meters maximum. That's a ground floor and three floors. And the maximum coverage was 50%. Sertas had very little to do with the application of the plan. He had, there was no accompanying policy to make sure who lived in this space. The number of devices which we've invented since Sardar's time to make sure that we have a mixed population in space, sometimes as simply as putting a percentage such as 15 percent on new development in Cambridge, Massachusetts, be allocated to affordable housing as a part of any building of new housing. There was nothing like that. So I envisioned an equal spatial plan, an isotropic plan spatially, but he didn't understand how to get an isotropic distribution of population. He envisioned bakers living next to bankers, uh, communities within this grid, each with their own school and so on and so on and so on. But he played little role that I know of in the execution of the plan. There's a great, oh, we've got a rush. There's a great paradox here. Over time, Vincent has become developed at a much greater density. Coverage was increased from 50% to 70%, even more than 70%. Height was increased to 24 meters. The volume of Serdar's plan was supposed to be 67,000 meters squared. The 1958 volume of what has been built on his plan is over three times as much 
290 million, 290,000 square meters. The paradox is that if you go down the Paseg de Gracia, which is a great road built through the Assange, this great avenue, which I'll show you an image of, you can feel the pedestrian volume. He allowed five meters of pedestrian width throughout the scheme. There's an intensity, an urban intensity in this area, which is part of its charm. Was Serda, Serda's plan was so pro forma in a sense that it allowed so many things to happen after his time, such as the increase of density and still, except for automobile traffic, able to cope with the build. The fact that he made sideways sidewalks that were that wide was an indication of, a, of, 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 of some thinking about the advent of density. He didn't pref include techniques which could frustrate subsequent development. What happened is that, as you'll see, let's look at the pictures. And I, the, Dan the Danube and Vienna below on the southern border of the Danube. Next. The walls is, has walkways and pedestrian perambulation zones prior to them being removed. The glacis on the right, next. The clear space after the walls have been taken down and the filling in of the space with a single spine, next. The parliament town hall, university, theater uh, combination. That's Hitler's drawing of the parliament, by the way. Not bad. Should have got into architecture school. Next. The medieval town hall, which still exists. Next. A group in Zinaus, an apartment building, large blocks, large volume, uh, uh, and the phenomenon again on the facade of decorating the facade with sculpture. Uh, this is not a flat facade. Next. The entrance to the apartment building has this zone of almost regal or royal uh, appurtenance. Uh, there's ex again, there's a decorative system which is open and free, giving a uh, special uh, uh, spatial quality to the entrance experience. Next. And Camilo Cite, the critique of the turbine, what he calls a turbine plaza, a plaza in which you enter and move, a plaza which is correctly organized, where you enter and, and leave only in special places. In the center of the plaza is a space for emotional uh, contemplation. His proposal in the shaded zones for recreating a proper appearance in front of the votive church, um, breaking down the openness which was called, which his detractors called Platzangst, he was afraid of open space, demarcating space in relation to particular buildings. Next. Otto Wagner's impression for the expansion of a city is a series of zones but articulated by a kind of expansionist 
line. Here is his uh, design for one of the, sorry, for one of the proposed extension expansion areas. Next. His preoccupation with designing industrial buildings. This is a sluice building on the Danube Canal. You can see is a can you see the wave-like decoration up on the right? This is a man who's carrying a kind of a hybrid system in his head. On the one hand, wanting to make something as decidedly modern as possible. On the other hand, decorating it with a, a frieze facade decoration. He's Subway stop the car plots next. His buildings in the railway sub new railway system. At the same time, this is a competition entry of his. I can't remember what the building was. I think the Academy of Kirk, Fine Arts. And this is the Postal Savings Bank building with the decorative system is on the facade in between the regular machine-like windows. Next. I didn't have time to go into this in greater detail, but this is Joseph Hoffman's work in the industrial design sector, great advances in modern design uh, using new materials. Uh, this is a, a list of the theater performances for a week in, uh, in Vienna. Next, Mahler's Great Symphony Number no. 6, and uh, to my mind, the greatest book of Freud's Interpretation of Dreams. 1911. Next. Karl Marx Hoff and some of the other Hoff blocks. Karl Marx Hoff on the left, I think it's one and a half kilometers long. Next. Again, the abiding preoccupation with sculpture and a flag. Uh, the entrances are, are not, these arches are not entrances, they zones of penetration. These are the entrance zones. Again, they decorated. Uh, the patterns are very small. Uh, once when I was visiting this building, the taxi driver had lived in this Karl Marx off. He said he left because he couldn't swing a cat in his apartment. Those were his words. Uh, an enormously powerful manifestation. Michael Graves must have looked at this architecture to gain some inspiration for his buildings. Uh, next. Barcelona. Look at the size of the ensembles compared to the old city. And you can imagine what Serdar would have done to Paris, the banlieue of Paris. It's worth uh, spending 10 minutes to, fast to talk about that as an alternative model for what the Paris Post modern Paris competition entries did. Next, Serdar's vision a three floor set of blocks differentiating between two blocks which only had one arm on them, others which had two buildings, some which had three buildings, some which had where the square was enclosed. The, what was actually built is represented on the right. Enclosed space in the center, not public space, but ambiguous space. 
sometimes place space which was taken over by residents, sometimes space which was made into parking lots, sometimes space which is just dilapidated, but no resolution of the internal space of a consolidated four-sided block. Next. You can see some of the interior of the There's a difference between making Karl Marx off interior space as a space for the community with clinics, shops, medical facilities, schools, and so on as a concept versus a concept which enclosed the block in order to galvanize the quality of the streets to increase density um, but left the whole completely un unavailable. Next. So Ras plan calls for the blocks to be truncated on the corners. Here you can see an intersection of the four corners of, uh, in, uh, leaving a messy uh, transportation intersection problem there. One of the arguments made by the Barcelonans today is that this creates an, another facade and each of these small square intersections have facade, unique facades facing onto them. Next. The Ramblas, the medieval public walk and the Paseo de Gracia, this great avenue which Links, links to the town of Gracia in the hills. Next. The Casa Batlo of Gaudi and the, sorry, Casa Mila on the left and the Casa Batlo on the right. Next. The great unfinished cathedral and attempts to modernize the Assange next. The Barcelona games are the only games that position the center of the city as central to the four sites. The Montjuic site on the top left, uh, the Keria site for the for the athletes' housing. Of all the Olympic sites, from Munich to Tokyo to Sydney to Melbourne and London and so on, none have incorporated the proposition within the central city system. Next. Two post Serda proposition. Could you just focus this one, please? Thank you. This is Corbusier's and a group called Gatpak, modern version of the extension of the Serda system. The streets are gone, or they ignored. The Redon, or tooth-like system of Corbusier's engaged in housing. There's a huge amount of open space which is not allocated to anybody in particular. One prefers the scheme on the left infinitely. A crazy man, Leon Creer, saying that the problem with Serdar's plan is that the 113 meter size is too large. Creer has a dislike of anything continuous. Uh, so he suggests that the block be broken up into four modules of about 25 meters each. Uh, what he, where he believes the market is for all of the shopping on these little corners uh, and the confusion caused by creating as many conf corners as he like 
you should go, Leon Kreese should visit Tel Aviv and see what happens when you subdivide blocks into two smaller distance. Uh, it's a silly diagram, but it's two examples of post Serta thinking. I think that's the lot. Oh, sorry. It is the idea of expanding from the, by leaving the center alone and expanding outwards. I'm just giving. This is Antonelli's plan for Torino. That is Castro's plan for Madrid. Next. This is Trotti's plan for Bari, and this is Cleanthus's plan. Cleanthus Schubert's plan for Athens. All suggest in the dark gray that you maintain the core of the city, take away the walls if necessary, and produce a free zone outside. Next. Here in the small town of Altamura in Puglia, you see the system operating in a small town. Radiating outwards are gates to the old city, uh, uh, I haven't got time to go into the detail. Here you see a grid system employed almost throughout ex the surroundings of the existing walled city. The walled city, if the walls are taken away, are replaced by a boulevard surrounding the city. Nothing like the boulevard of the Ringstrasse. Okay. Sorry it's so rushed, but the world is full of information. <laughs> <laughs>